The network layer provides support for inter-network communication. It facilitates packet forwarding and routing between devices on separate networks. It enables end-to-end -end communication. Our discussion of the network layer will be split into two parts. In this first lecture, we will discuss the architecture of the internet, how routers work, the internet protocol, and the structure of the IP packet. In the following lecture, we will look into the various routing protocols which dictate the rules that routers and autonomous systems follow on how to forward packets such that they reach their final destination as efficiently as possible. We will talk about shortest path algorithms like Dijkstra and Bellman Forward and how they are used to route traffic on the internet. The consequence of doing lectures in this order is that during this first lecture, you have to assume that each router knows the best path to forward packets to, and that this entire process is efficient. More concisely, if we are sending a message over the internet from computer A to B, at each router, we can use an oracle to determine which router will be the next hop. The details about this oracle algorithm will be revealed in the next lecture, as well as its runtime complexities. A local area network, or LAN, is a grouping of computers that are interconnected within a single physical network. Typically, devices on a LAN can easily communicate with each other, but require special configuration in order to communicate with devices outside the local network. Networks are separated by routers. A single network may have multiple routers, each acting as a gateway between other networks. If the topology of multiple connected networks is known beforehand, and we have the MAC addresses of all intermediate nodes, this can be done solely through the data link layer, through the use of network bridges, which are devices that connect two or more LANs. Even with routers in play, if we control the entire network, we can communicate using just the data link layer. When using the internet, though, we need to be able to communicate with networks that we don't own and are connected to routers that we have no control over. The network layer facilitates delivery of these messages by getting us closer and closer to the final destination, one hop at a time. IPv4, a network layer protocol, facilitates communications between networks that are not known beforehand. The most widely used protocol on the network layer is the Internet Protocol, abbreviated IP. It has two versions, IPv4 and IPv6. Other protocols, like ICMP, also exist, but is mainly used for error reporting purposes, and its header is largely the same as the IP datagram with a few additional fields. Before your computer sends a message off to the Internet, it attaches an IP header to it. This header, for the most part, stays the same at each hop along the path. Certain values like TTL are decreased, but the address fields are maintained. This is in contrast to data link layer protocols like Ethernet and 802.11, where the frame headers are removed at each hop. The IP header contains multiple fields, the most important of which is the source and destination address. Addressing in IPv4 is done with IP addresses. Each device connected to the internet is identified by this. These IP addresses are leased to individuals by internet service providers or ISPs. Your monthly internet bill includes payment for a temporary lease of an IP address from your ISP's pool of available addresses. You are not guaranteed the same IP address each time unless you pay for business class internet that includes a static IP. IP addresses are a 32-bit number composed of four octets. Each octet is typically represented as a number from 0 to 255 separated by dots. For example, 172.16.254.1. This format is called dotted decimal notation. Due to IP addresses being a 32-bit number, there is an upper limit of 2 to the 32 or roughly 4.2 billion addresses. While enormous at the time of the internet's creation, the wide adoption of it has caused these numbers to quickly deplete. By January of 2020, all IPv4 addresses have been allocated between various ISPs around the world. 
This problem is called the IPv4 address exhaustion problem. IP addresses are composed of two parts, a network portion and a host portion. The bits of an IP address designated for the network portion uniquely identifies the network, while the host portion allows all devices on the network to share the same prefix. By decreasing the size of the network portion, you allocate more devices to a single host, allowing them to have more connected devices. By decreasing the number of bits in the networking portion, you allocate more bits for the host components, allowing a single network to have more devices. The drawback to this is that you have fewer unique networks, which exacerbates the IPv4 exhaustion problem, especially if these hosts remain unused. This next section is historical, so we don't really use this nowadays, but it helps us understand the IPv4 exhaustion problem better. Originally, these network addresses were divided into network hosts at every eight bits, or one octet, creating three classes of addresses. Class A networks identified with a first octet in the range of 0 to 126 had one octet for its network portion and three octets for the host portion. This allowed for 2 to the 24 minus 2, or roughly 16 million devices per network. Class B addresses identified with the first octet in the range 128 to 191 had two octets for the network portion and two octets for the hosts. This allowed for 2 to the 16th minus 2, or 65,534 devices per network. Finally, we have class C addresses, which are identified with the first octet in the range 192 to 223. These had three octets for the network portion and one octet for the host. This allowed for 2 to the 8 minus 2, or 254 hosts. The drawback to this classful system was because there were only three rigid sizes of IP address blocks, small companies could outgrow their allocated class C address, and their only option would be to either get another class C address and combine the two, but this would create two separate ranges of IP addresses for a single organization. Their other option was to upgrade to a class B address, giving them 256 times as much addressing space as they previously had. This could also happen to organizations that outgrew their class B address, but with the added complication that there could only ever exist 126 class A addresses. In modern applications, we use classless interdomain routing, or CIDR. In CIDR, Instead of an entire octet of 8 bits being changed at once, a single bit is moved from the network to the host. When using CIDR, IP addresses have two forms. One to identify the network, called the CIDR address. This includes a network portion, a host portion, and a subnet identifier. For example, 64.64.0.0 the number after the slash represents the subnet identifier and specifies the number of bits that will be used for the network portion. In this example, 20 bits will be allocated for the network and the remaining 12 bits are used for hosts. This network can have up to 2 to the 12 minus 2 hosts. There are two reserved addresses for each network the host address of all zeros is reserved to identify the network itself. The host address with all ones is reserved as a broadcast address. There is also an IP address for individual hosts. The key difference is the lack of a subnet identifier. When sending messages to individual machines, we do not care about how the IP addresses are allocated. All we care about is that each address is unique. So, IP addresses are used to identify individual machines, while CIDR addresses represent ranges of IP and are used to identify entire networks. So, 
IP addresses represent individual machines, while CIDR addresses represent ranges of IP addresses and are used to identify entire networks. CIDR fixes the allocation problem of classical domain routing. Networks looking to add more hosts could exchange their existing CIDR address for an available address with one bit shifted over. As an example, a network could return its CIDR address 64.64.0.0 slash 20 in exchange for the CIDR address 80.80.0.0 slash 19. Because the network portion has been reduced by a single bit, this network can have twice as many hosts while ensuring all devices on the network share the same network prefix. The protocol data unit of IPv4 is the IPv4 packet, also called the IPv4 datagram. This header wraps our payload and gets rewrapped with a data link layer header before being transmitted. The first four bits represents the version and determines which version of IP this packet is using. The field after that is the internet header length. The size of the IP header is variable because of the options field. There is a minimum header size of 20 bytes, which is also the most common header size. We can derive that value by noticing that in this diagram, each row is 32 bits or four bytes in length, and that there are five rows, not including the options fields. The next field, type of service, specifies data about quality of service technologies. The field after that, total length, specifies the length of the entire packet. The maximum size of a IP packet is 65,535 bytes. The next row deals with the fragmentation of packets. Should a particular packet exceed the maximum transmission unit, or MTU, of a link, that packet will need to be fragmented before it is sent off. Packets are reassembled at their final destination. The identification field, which is a 16-bit field, is used to collect and group together fragmented messages. When IP messages are fragmented, this field is used to identify which fragments belong to the same original message. There are three flags that follow. The first bit is a reserved flag and is always zero. The second bit is the don't fragment bit and indicates if a datagram is allowed to be fragmented. The last bit is the more fragments flag and indicates if there are more fragments. The next field, the fragment offset, is a 13-bit field used to help sequence packets that are fragmented. And it does so by indicating to the recipient device where in the overall message each particular fragment should be placed. Moving on to the next row, the first field that we'll talk about is the time to live or TTL. This is a 8-bit field and it represents how many router hops a datagram can traverse before it's discarded. We discard long-lived messages on the network to prevent loops when there is a misconfigured or malicious router. Without the TTL, it is possible for a misconfigured router to cause a packet to stay on the wire forever, forwarding messages so that it eventually comes back to itself. The TTL decrements after each hop, and when they hit zero, the packet is dropped. The default TTL is 64 hops. Next, the protocol is a 8-bit field used to determine the transport layer protocol used one layer above. The next field is the header checksum, which is a lesser used 16-bit field used for data integrity. The checksum is not really used because both major data link layer protocols, Ethernet and 802.11, provide data integrity using the frame check sequence. If we look at the IPv6 header field, in fact, we will see no checksum fields. And in fact, there is no data integrity field. Instead, that task is offloaded to the data link layer. When a router receives an IP packet, first it'll see if the incoming packet's destination address is for a host on its own network. And if it is, the router makes the final delivery. 
Otherwise, if the destination address matches a network site or range in the routing table, it will forward the message to the next router out on a specified interface. We will go into the details of how the routing table is populated with entries in our next lecture. All routers are configured with a special catch-all entry called the default gateway, typically your ISP, which is an IP address to forward messages to in the event that no other forwarding rules apply. So let's look at a sample exchange between two hosts, host one and host two. When arriving on the router, the packet will have its TTL field decreased by one, and the entire packet will be dropped if the TTL field hits zero. Then the router looks up the next hop in its own routing table and performs fragmentation if required before sending the data to the next hop out on a specified interface. These individual hops are chained together until we reach the final destination. Routers are considered network layer hardware because they inspect the destination IP address in each packet before making a decision on what interface to forward the packet to. There are several IP ranges that are not to be allocated to any entity. These addresses are meant only to be used locally. Traffic using these reserved IP ranges never leaves the network. There are many reserved IP ranges, but for this course, we only care about three. The 127.0.0.0 slash 8 block. This is used for the loopback address, which is when a host wants to send a message to itself. It is used quite often in netcode development as the operating system will simulate the requests without needing any actual hardware. The CIDR address 192.0.0.0/24 is used for a local area network. It can support up to 256 devices. If this is not enough, you can also use the 10.0.0.0/8 range, but we won't be discussing that. Finally, the range 224.0.0.0/4 is used for IP multicast. IP multicasting uses a one-to-many association where datagrams are routed simultaneously in a single transmission to multiple recipients. A server only needs to send the message once, and machines will listen in on a specified IP. IP multicasting uses a one-to-many association where datagrams are routed simultaneously in a single transmission to multiple recipients. A server only needs to send the message once, and all configured machines will listen in on the specified IP. Video surveillance systems are probably the most common usage, with many closed-circuit TVs broadcasting on specific IP addresses that you can navigate your browser to and watch. Because these are local IP addresses, multicast traffic will never leave your network. Other usages include PC ghosting, and software updates, voice over IP, video monitoring, and conference calls. Your home network can have up to 256 devices in the address block 192.0.0.0/8. When a device connects to your home network, it is temporarily allocated one of these addresses through a process called DHCP. The dynamic host configuration protocol is used to temporarily assign a local IP address to a newly connected device. The DHCP protocol has four stages. DHCP discover, where a newly connected device sends a discovery request that is broadcasted on the entire network and includes the device's MAC address. DHCP offer, all DHCP servers who receive a request and have an available IP address offer to lease the IP address to the newly connected device. DHCP request, the newly connected device sends a request to the server of the first response they receive. When receiving multiple offers, it assumes that the first offer has the least latency. DHCP acknowledgement, upon receiving the DHCP request, the server creates a record of it in the DHCP table to keep track of which local IP addresses are currently in use. Then, it sends an acknowledgement 
which includes additional information like expiration. IP addresses assigned with the DHCP protocol are designated to be dynamic IPs. Dynamic IPs revert back to the DHCP server once they are expired. They are useful for devices that don't need to communicate with other local devices, like desktops and laptops. We can also go into the router settings to configure a static IP address. Unlike DHCP, static IP addressing does not expire unless revoked. They are useful for devices that others may want to connect to, like a network printer. This is because DHCP will automatically assign any newly connected device an IP address from its available pool. If a lease expires or we lose power, there is no guarantee that the devices, when they reconnect, will get the same IP address. When using a network printer, we are sending a print job to an IP address. Should the IP address of that printer change because DHCP gave it a new one, we may wind up sending our print jobs to the wrong location. IP addresses belong to the network, not the devices attached to those networks. These devices lease an IP address using the DHCP protocol. This is in contrast to the MAC address, which stays the same regardless of where you are connected to. Each computer connected to a network is leased a local IP address. This address is unique to the network, but can be reused outside the network as it is a reserved address, which will never leave the local network. Finally, we'll discuss the Address Resolution Protocol, or ARP. ARP is a data link layer protocol used to map a known IPv4 address to an unknown MAC address. It cannot be used outside of local networks. It is used predominantly to find a MAC address given a IP address. All network devices will keep an ARP table, a list of IP addresses and known MAC addresses associated with each device. ARP table entries expire after a short period of time to ensure network changes are accounted for. In a Windows machine, you can look at your ARP table by typing in to a command prompt, ARP-A. If a router receives a unknown IP address, it will broadcast an ARP request out on the entire network. The device that owns that IP address will respond back with its MAC address, after which the router will update its ARP table before forwarding the request. In this lecture, there was a key assumption that we made, that our routers already knew the best path to get our message delivered. In our next lecture, we'll discuss routing protocols, which populate our router's memory, called a routing table, with CIDR addresses, and how it keeps those records up to date with a constantly changing internet.